Okay, um, I don't have any slides, I just have devices. Um, so what I'm gonna try to show you a little bit about uh, Android. Um, uh, since I'm on the Android team, that's a natural thing for me to do. Um, so Android started about uh, several years ago with one really simple idea, and that was to provide a open mobile platform uh, with the sole purpose of driving innovation in the mobile industry. Um, and this idea has really taken off. Um, so you know, about two and a half years ago, we launched the first Android device. It was the uh, T-Mobile G1. Uh, now, two and a half years later, we have over 170 compatible Android devices available in the market. Um, and they're being delivered by 169 carriers uh, across 96 countries around the world. Um, and also our, our developer ecosystem is working really well. So we have over 150,000 applications in our Android market store. Um, and we have, in fact, uh, I believe the latest number is 27 handset manufacturers who've adopted Android. Um, and one of the things that we're noticing is that the more people become aware of how the operating system on their phone affects the functionality of the device, the more handset manufacturers and platform providers, that's us, have to innovate and compete. And we literally think this is going to cause a dynamic effect that will make mobile phones better and better. Um, now, um, we've been working pretty hard on Android, so uh, about every six months or so, we target trying to get a release out. Um, if you don't uh, already know this, uh, we, we name our releases after desserts, um, so in alphabetical order. So we have like cupcake, donut, eclair, uh, froyo, gingerbread's the latest mobile uh, operating system release, and uh, honeycomb's the latest tablet version. And if you ever happen to visit California, you'll see outside building 44, uh, which is our main Android building, you'll see all these desserts dotted around. It looks pretty bizarre. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, really just the latest in terms of software and hardware, both on mobile and tablets. I don't have very much time, so I'm just going to, I've just picked a couple of demos. Um, I suppose the, the underlying theme of these demos is really about cloud computing, because um, when you think about mobile, it's not just about the devices themselves, but it's about pervasive connectivity. These devices are connected to the internet 24-7, and as mobile networks get faster and faster, the connection between the phone and the cloud, the, you know, really the large-scale data centers, becomes more seamless. And what you realize is your phone isn't really just a little computer. It's actually it's, it's a tentacle of a supercomputer in the cloud. So you'll see that theme running through my demos. Uh, okay, so let's, let me get started. Um, let me show you this. This is the uh, Google Nexus S. Um, so we launched this in late December. It's the latest version of the Nexus family. It's a product co-developed by Samsung and Google. Uh, we're selling it through uh, Best Buy in the US and, and Carphone Warehouse in Europe. Um, one of the really nice things about this phone is it's the first Android device that includes an NFC chip, or near-field communication. Um, and what that allows you to do is the phone can basically read off smart objects. Uh, these smart objects are called NFC tags. Um, I have one here. It's just a little sticker in this case. It can be in any form factor. Um, and there's lots of use cases for this. So one example is you're in a cinema. You see a movie poster. It's got some icon marking that it's got a tag in it. You put your phone against the poster or you swipe it. And next thing you can watch the movie trailer. Um, and let me just show you a very simple example of, of, of how that would work. So um, I have the tag here. What I did was I encoded the the Google Maps Place page for Buckingham Palace. So maybe you would envisage this as on a window and you tap it. Um, and so by just simply putting the phone uh, over the tag like this, the phone will respond and you can see the URL uh, and it'll launch the Place page for Buckingham Palace. Um, now that's a pretty kind of pedestrian demo, but when you start thinking about the potential, you suddenly realize this is actually going to be revolutionary. So um, you just need to look towards Japan and look what people are using NFC for today. Uh, they have a variant that they call Felica. Um, and, and it's very common for people to use their phones, uh, to use the Suica system to access the transit system, but also to make small uh, payments. And the uh, NFC chip on the Android device has got a, what's called a secure element. So it can literally run these applications for commerce. Um, and because this is Android, because it's open, we've created a whole set of APIs that any developer can use. So expect to see uh, things happen in that space. Um, let me show you another example of an application that I quite like. Um, so this is called Google Goggles. Um, and you're probably wondering what this weird pattern is behind me. So all will become clear. Um, so, so Google Goggles is a, it's kind of an innovative experimental app, if you like. 
Um, we, we started thinking about, you know, we use, you know, when people search on mobile, they type. We've also got speech recognition working. Um, and we started thinking, well, what about the camera? Can we use that as an input for search? And so Goggles allows you to take a picture of an object, be that a landmark, a book cover, a CD cover, some text, um, et cetera. And, and it will actually try to recognize that object and perform a search for you. So um, this picture here is uh, some... Uh, artwork, and I know very little about art. Um, so what I'm going to do is take a picture of it. And now what's happening is the picture is sent up to our cloud, uh, to our massive data centers, which performs uh, uh, vision recognition on it. Uh, and sure enough, it's identified this as the uh, Kandinsky Farb study. Uh, if I click on this here, it will then go, of course, talk to our search engine and get results for it. Um, so without even typing it, uh, I, I'm suddenly a um, an art expert. Um, another example of, uh, of a, cool, a fun demo is um, solving Sudoku puzzles. Um, now, it turns out um, humans are really good at certain things, and they're th good at things that like computers will never be able to do. Um, Sudoku is not one of them. Um, Sudoku really just requires an iterative kind of menial algorithm to solve. In fact, um, I shouldn't, uh, well, I was going to give it away, but I'll give it away. If you're interviewing for Google, some people like asking how to solve Sudoku puzzles, so there you go. Um, I think I just got myself in trouble for that. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Um, if I take a picture of the puzzle like this, um, again, uh, Goggles will use its optical character recognition to identify um, the characters, and you can see here, it's actually identified this as a Sudoku puzzle. If I click on here, we have this button that says solve, and if I uh, press solve, uh, sure enough, uh, Google has <laughs> solved your Sudoku puzzle. Um, and actually for the marketing video, it turns out that one of the engineers in Google is the world champion at Sudoku, and unfortunately she uh, doesn't stand a chance in this case. Um, so that was fun. Um, so, so the other example I want to show you, again, another cloud-based service is Google Translate. Um, and what this allows you to do is it allows you to type or speak a phrase and then uh, translate it into one of 50 different languages. Again, the phrase is sent to the cloud-based uh, uh, data center as we perform machine translation on that, return the results. Um, and one feature that we added recently is, and it's still in alpha or beta, I guess, um, is, is conversation mode. The idea is using your phone to facilitate a conversation between two people in two different languages. Now, unfortunately, this only works in Spanish, and I can't speak Spanish. This is going to be a pretty rough demo, so you're going to have to imagine a little bit. Um, so, like, let's say I'm the English person, and, and I start a conversation. Hello. Um, and I'll enter conversation mode. Um, let me actually plug in some speakers so you can hear this. So just bear with me one second. Okay, so hopefully we have sound. Um, if not, my demo is not going to be very impressive. Um, so what I can do is I can enter conversation mode here. Hola. And it says, hola. Um, and now you see it's in a kind of a conversation flow, so I can respond in, in Spanish. So naturally enough, I'll say hello back. Hola. You're now seeing the extent of my Spanish. Oh, see, it said hola, so incorrect. <laughs> <coughs> let, let, me, let me try one more time. If you could speak Spanish, this would work. Hola. Does that sound more authentic? Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> well, you know, so let's, let's translate that Please. anyway. That turns out to be in cues. Um, okay. Uh, I don't like cues either. Uh, or don't like you either. Um, Yo no te gusta. Which is currently the sentiment I'm feeling towards Google Translate. Okay. I warned you that was risky. Okay. Uh, let, let me switch to a less risky demo. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, and let me just zoom out so you can see it, is and I, I need to speed up a little bit. So this is the uh, latest uh, version of Android. It's Honeycomb. It's a version of Android optimized for tablets. This is the Motorola Zoom tablet. Um, with every release of Android, by the way, we partner with a lead OEM. So with, with the Nexus S, with Samsung, with the tablet, it's Motorola. We just released this uh, last week. Um, and uh, one of the cool things you'll notice with Honeycomb the first time you use it is we've, we've taken this opportunity not just to optimize for tablet, but also to uh, really um, rejuvenate the, UVI, the, the UI. So you'll see this really nice user interface. We call it the hologram. 
Um, you'll notice there's uh, software buttons at the bottom left here, so they're not actually hard keys. We've got a new button here, for example, for multitasking. You see uh, all the applications I currently have running. I can flip between them. What's really cool is it's showing you a snapshot of where the applications were when you left them. Um, one popular feature on Android is uh, the ability to customize your home screen with widgets. Uh, Honeycomb's no different. In fact, we made the, the widgets better. You can see email. I can see upcoming emails, uh, check if there's anything important. I can see calendar invites. Um, I can see my favorite bookmarks. I can quickly access them. On this screen, I've got some family photos. I have a picture. Uh, I have uh, YouTube videos. These are videos recommended to me. Um, and then I've got a set of applications. So I have, I have everything at my fingertips, and this sort of shows you how a operating system built for multitasking uh, can really come to life. So Android's doing the, uh, the multitasking, so I don't have to. Uh, very quickly, let me show you a few applications. So the first one I'm gonna show you is uh, Books. Um, so this is a classic use case for mobile. Uh, this is Google Books. We have three million uh, publications in the cloud. Uh, no matter where you access books from, be it a, a web browser, your phone, a tablet, we'll always remember your purchases. We'll even remember the last page you were on. Um, on the tablet version, we have this really nice 3D carousel. So we res in your books as you move and de-res the old ones out. Uh, if I click on a book, I can start reading it. Um, we have this really nice hardware accelerated uh, interface here. Um, so it feels like an actual book. You'll notice the UI has gone into what we call lights out mode. The buttons have sort of have hidden themselves. So there's nothing between you and the actual task you're performing. If I click anywhere, they come back and I can return to the home screen. Um, another application that works really well on tablet is uh, Maps. Um, so let me launch Google Maps here. And we made a radical different change, change to maps recently. So previously, we actually had um, images on the cloud. So each of the tiles on the map would be pulled down. And so the problem with that is that when you would scale the map, we'd have to grab new tiles at a different uh, scale. What we've changed to now is vector-based maps. So we just sort of pull down lines and, and points literally from the server, and the actual device does the rendering, so it does the drawing. The result is you get this much smoother experience. You see uh, zooming, panning is very smooth because we're just scaling the data. I can rotate. Um, and also, the information is actually in 3D. So if I do this multi-point gesture like this, I get a 3D perspective. I can rotate around. Um, now, what's really nice about Google Maps is we have building information, 3D building information for about 100 cities around the world. So let me just give you an example. So if I click on Empire State Building, um, this brings me to Manhattan, of course. Um, and then I can zoom in. And you'll see the buildings will animate into position as I get to lower zoom levels. Again, I can go to a 3D perspective. There's the Empire State Building. I can rotate around and get the ideal perspective for me. Um, OK, and then the, the last example I want to show you is uh, speech recognition. So to do this, let me just, uh, I'm going to move the, the earpiece. So hopefully these guys are going to mute it very quickly so I don't blow up the uh, auditorium. OK, um, and then I'm going to plug it into the tablet. Okay. So um, it turns out that tablets are easier to type on than mobile, but still not as easy as a desktop. Um, and so there are certain tasks that you do that are still faster by voice than it would be for, to type. So a classic case is search. So let me just show you how this works. Pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge at sunset. Um, so this is just a classic, you know, maybe you want to make a web search. Um, and then, sure enough, loads Google, I'll get my result. That's a lot faster than typing, right? Um, but you want to go further, right? So, so we've been creating something that we call voice actions. And the idea is to perform common actions on the phone or tablet um, that would normally require multiple steps, but that you should just be able to do one shot in voice. So classic cases, I need to send a quick email. Send email to Louise, subject Facebook, message, have you put your photos on Facebook yet, question mark. And again, the audio is sent to this cloud. The cloud does machine recognition on it and then returns the results to the device. You see Gmail loads up here. You see all the information to Louise, subject Facebook, have you got your photos? I can press one click and just go. Um, another example, uh, something that I do very often, setting an alarm, right? Setting an alarm takes multiple steps. It should be really easy. Set alarm for 8.30 AM. Um, and then you'll see a confirmation screen, uh, alarm set for 8.30 AM, press done, and off I go. Um, and the final example, um, tablets are really good for media. Um, so whether that's consuming you know, movies or videos or music. Um, and uh, one thing I like doing is just using my voice to start playing different music. So let me try this quickly. Listen to Lady Gaga, Bad Romance. Again, audio goes up to the server. 
We do a translation of it, comes back. Oh, listen to Lady Gaga Starbucks. Okay. I think there was a cough. And let me try that one more time because Spotify crashed. Listen to Lady Gaga Bad Romance. Now, what happens is the system recognizes that I said listen to, and then it sends an instruction to the, to the device saying, are there any applications that support listen to? Spotify, third party application, does that. It's a cloud based service. You can find the music. <laughs> I apologize if you don't like Lady Gaga. Uh, okay, so uh, let me park it there.